Hello, and welcome to NACOM's 2021 Annual Conference of Video Bonus Sessions. On behalf of NACOM President T.J. Bement and President-elect and Conference Chair Kathy Griffin, welcome to today's session. NACOM would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the State Justice Institute for their support of this and the programs of the annual conference. We would like to thank the Conference Development Committee for creating this educational programming for 2021. My name is Jude Del Prior. I'm a former NACOM president and presently assist the association in education planning. With me today is Erin Carr, NACOM Association Manager. Today's program is being pre-recorded as a bonus to both live and virtual conference attendees. Our presenters have provided their contact information that will be uploaded and posted with this video in the event you have any questions after viewing. Today's session entitled Excavating Phantom Communities to Tailor Justice Outcomes. This program is a review of how the courts can customize resolutions in criminal and family division cases and bring to bear systemic change by disinterring the specific agents of socialization that guide behavior and accounts for the singular most impactful influence in an individual's life. Our presenter today is Giuseppe M. Fazzari, PhD. He is a professor in the criminal justice department at Seton Hall University, where he also served as an assistant dean of continuing education and professional studies. He was a lead developer for the NACOM core competencies and serves as faculty for the National Center for State Courts. He is a former court executive and chief administrative officer for the New Jersey Judiciary and has been a consultant for several domestic and international court systems. His first book entitled Historical Dictionary of American Criminal Justice was published by Roman and Littlefield in 2019. He is a writer and director of the award-winning feature documentary, Why They Kill, based on the book by the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Richard Rhodes. He is a fellow of the Institute for Court Management and is a past president of the New Jersey Association of Criminal Justice Educators. Joe, the platform is yours. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Jude. And it's a great pleasure uh, to present before the, uh, the wonderful uh, membership of NACOM. I've been a longtime member, longtime affiliate uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the association throughout my career uh, in the courts, as well as now, you know, being in the, on the academic end of things. So it gives me great pleasure. Uh, I'll be it remotely. I'd rather be doing this live, of course, but I'll be it remotely. I'm, um, I, it's a real uh, a pleasure and thank you for that warm introduction, Jude. So today, what I'm gonna do is um, just for a, a short while, what I'm gonna discuss with you is the concept of uh, a phantom community um, uh, to try to tailor some justice outcomes. And so ordinarily this kind of session, uh, and I've done it for both domestic as well as international courts, this kind of training typically to really sort of do a deep dive into the concepts that I'm gonna be discussing with all of you today, um, is usually a two to three day type of training that I've done with court executives and, and presiding judges. So I'm gonna give you kind of the 10,000 uh, foot kind of purview uh, over, uh, preview, excuse me, over uh, the concepts and, and the ideas of the fan community and what it really kind of means for all of us who've worked uh, and, and try to help the public uh, through the purposes and responsibilities in which the courts uh, uh, stand for. So having said all that, uh, so over the course of the, about, you know, the next hour or so, I'm going to high, I'm going to go through basically, my goal is to go through three, uh, three objectives. And so the first objective is to um, define what we mean by the, the uh, what we mean by the phantom community. Uh, the second is going I'm, to, I'm going to go through and try to understand how the phantom community, after defining it, how does the phantom community come to be developed? Not just in the folks that we're uh, uh, overseeing or, or the folks that we're helping, the members of the public who are coming to the court. We're not just talking about the phantom communities of those folks, but the idea that we all individually, positive and negative, all have phantom communities. So what are the influences and the impacts? How do we all come to develop what this phantom community is. 
And finally, I'm in a very, in a very superficial sense, but just to give you sort of a, a reader's digest version, if you will, of how this concept uh, comes to be applied in the work of the courts. Uh, and having been, having worked in the courts for many, many years, uh, one of the courts being the most voluminous courts uh, here in New Jersey, uh, I'll, I'll share with you uh, how this concept was applied in the courts where I specifically work, uh, as well as some of the courts where I've consulted in. So, okay, so the first, let's talk about the FANA community itself. How is it defined? Okay, so there's two individuals that I'm gonna reference throughout this presentation. And I'm gonna sort of pepper in a couple other scholars, uh, but I promise it won't be too academic. So I'll try to bridge that chasm that inevitably exists between the sort of academic uh, world of things, as well as, you know, all of us practitioners, you know, and sort of bring that, bring, bridge that chasm together. So there are two individuals that I'm gonna be talking about when I talk about uh, the FAM community and its application, of course. And the first person is gonna be a, he's a renowned criminologist, his name is Lonnie Athens. And this concept is something that he developed. It's something that he came up with after many, many years of being uh, in the field as a criminologist and interviewing scores uh, of individuals. The other individual that I'm gonna mention is a medical doctor by the name of Vincent Felitti, uh, who's based out of, uh, incidentally, he's based out of actually San Diego, California, where our annual conference is being held this year. Um, and his, um, his idea where I sort of, where it dovetails with the Phantom community, I'll get to it momentarily, is called, is his, what is known as the ACE, ACES study which means ACE is the adverse childhood um, uh, impact. So the, the, the ad, uh, adverse childhood experiences impact study. And that was developed by Vincent Felitti. So those two individuals I'm going to be discussing throughout the presentation. So the Phantom community, as I mentioned, Dr. Athens, a crim renowned criminologist came up with this, uh, this idea. And he developed this from a theory known as the violinization theory. And he delves into what he terms as this fan of community to explain behavior in general, meaning that there's a universality to it, as I mentioned to you early. So we all have a fan of community. But more specifically, what his study kind of delved into is it's in, an, in its application with violent criminal actions. And so he came up with this idea called the violentization theory. Violentization, a play on words, meaning the socialization of violence. So he talked about it as a process akin to any other course of development. And it shows how individuals learn to be violent through social experiences. And the difference in an individual who's violent versus who's not, the difference lies in their phantom communities. So individuals become, folks, what their significant experience entail, which in turn, which in turn has a potential impact on the significant experiences that others have. So he came up with this theory after interviewing scores of dangerous violent criminals, uh, as well as participating and observing in a few. So real world kind of experience is what uh, this theory is based on and the, and the concept. Uh, and so the individuals that he interviewed uh, all demonstrated what he referred to as an ultra violent self-image. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what we, how we become uh, how the self-image image sort of comes and emerges. And he showed that uh, that an individuals, all of our individual human behavior is precipitated by our own uh, individual self-portrait, which is cultivated by one's phantom community. So contrary to the, opin uh, the opinions that are proffered by the media, other kind of political pundits, the theory demonstrates that the individual's deliberation and the process by which individuals make decisions and carry out and behave in their day-to-day -day life. And whether some individuals uh, choose to commit a violent act wind up being all based in this observation that he came up with and in the development of this phantom community. And so they interpret experiences in a malignant way and then they respond violently based on those interpretations. And those interpretations emerge after consulting with their FANA community. So learning through this FANA community, as, we, as I mentioned, is basically occurs through social experiences. And those social experiences, uh, while 
uh, come through three different groups, primary groups, secondary groups, and what Dr. Athens referred to as the phantom community. So although all individuals comprise society, learning is a more intimate process. It occurs in smaller groups created by members within larger society. And so these smaller groups can be classified as either primary groups or secondary groups. Now our primary group is more, uh, is, is the more influential of the two. Uh, this idea of the primary uh, group uh, was developed by this uh, sociologist by the name of Charles Cooley. And he referred to the primary group as our individual springs of life. Uh, and so the sociologist, he came up with this concept of this, uh, of another concept called the look, looking glass self. The idea that a person's self grows out of a society's interpersonal interactions and the perceptions of others. And so their value, our values, our attitudes become a part of the person's thought processes and they induce a perspective of how we come to view and understand the world. And so the primary group being the more influential of the two, they're comprised of the folks that are closest to us, our close family, our friends, our husband, uh, wives and, and children and uh, uncles and aunts, the people that we have you know, daily kind of interaction with uh, and are the closest to us. Okay. The secondary group uh, is larger and a more indistinguishable type of group. And this type, these, the individuals who comprise this group, they exist only really to accomplish a specific purpose and interact involve, and they interact with us involving only parts of, uh, of our personality. And so for instance, you know, our membership here in NACOM would constitute in the networks that we establish in an association like NACOM, for instance, would, co would uh, comprise our secondary group. Now, a deeper layer within these two groups is known as the phantom community. And so individuals will feel a conflict when these decision, when the decision-making that we make contradict the values that are, that are espoused uh, in our phantom community, because this is the belief system that we get from our phantom community is a yardstick that we use to judge others as well as ourselves. And so Dr. Athens refers to it as the audience of real or imaginary people whose conception of uh, communal life, especially our and other and other people's place in it, we always hold close to our hearts and usually take for granted. So in other words, they sort of follow us. And so those are the kind of things that really sort of impact us the most when we consider these different types of groups. So when we're comparing primary versus secondary groups, this is the, these are sort of the main distinctions, right? The size is usually typically smaller in primary groups, secondary groups like our network, like I mentioned to you in, in NACOM is usually large. Uh, the duration of our, our, our relationships in primary groups are often uh, long-term or permanent a more influential. And so that phantom community is deeper within that long-term, more into that permanency in which we find ourselves in. And so, um, so in a nutshell, the phantom, community, um, the phantom community is defined in accordance to the people who we hold closest to us, those individuals who are most influential to us and we carry with us, we use their value system, we use how they view and understand the world, the closest to us, we use it as a yardstick in understanding ourselves, and it has the most impact in our day-to-day -day, uh, decision-making. Now, one of the most, so let's talk a little bit now about the, um, the phantom community uh, development. How does, how does the phantom community, uh, A, develop, and then we'll talk about the sort of impacts and the influences that it has on us, and then finally, uh, how, we, uh, how we apply it to the work of what we all do in the courts. Okay, so one of the uh, most notable American uh, sociologists of the 20th century is George Herbert Mead. He was the founder of social psychology uh, and typically what we come to think of the sociological tradition in America, uh, George Herbert Mead was very, very influential in that regard. And so one of the most influential ideas that Mead had was his theory of the formation of the mind and the self in relation to how we communicate with one another. And he came up with this idea, um, a genius sort of concept known as the generalized other. 
Uh, some of you who have taken any kind of introductory course uh, in, in sociology will probably be, be familiar with it. But generalized other, what he proposed, what me proposed here is that society is sustained uh, through this sort of communication process. Uh, that being kind of the ability to take the role for each of us, to take the role of another, uh, to then assume the perspective of the generalized other, which allows us to have this kind of cooperative relationship that we all have in society. And it's in that cooperative within society that he contended controls or mostly controls for antisocial behavior. And so the generalized other um, refers to basically the actor, me, you, our perception of community's expectations, the general attitudes, right, that everyone has of us within that society, which then contemporaneously drives our behavior. And so he posited that this generalized other allows one to kind of construct the expectation of how other individuals, including the individuals who are not familiar to us, will behave in various social situations. Right? There are two shortcomings, however, with his generalized other concept that Athens sort of uh, takes apart and then comes to explain in what I defined for you as the fan of community. And so his generalized uh, uh, other concept for explaining behavior uh, falls short in these two areas. First, it does not account for the differences between the conformist as well as the nonconformist. If you consider that the generalized other leads people to um, uh, satisfy community values, satisfy uh, community expectations during the performance of any particular social act, it doesn't account for the differences between the people who are doing what they're supposed to be doing or expectations of them in society versus those who don't. And so, as you know, working in the courts, we're dealing with quote unquote nonconformists all the time. So his generalized other doesn't account for that. The other area that it doesn't account for is that it fails to explain the permanency of our self that perseveres over a lifetime. With that dialogue that occurs, our expectations within that cooperative in, in society, it does, not, it does not account for the permanency of ourselves. So if I move, let's say, from one state to another, from New Jersey to, say, Idaho, or from Nevada to Florida, or go overseas, it doesn't account for that permanency of myself when I move from one environment to another. And so it does not, so in short, um, needs generalized other doesn't explain why different people in the same um, corporal community act differently when basically faced with the same situation. And so um, Athens' phantom community fills, uh, fills the, these two gaps by showing behavior is not precipitated um, so much in response to the generalized other, but there's a deeper layer there. So it's produced in reaction to that individual's fan of community, which is specific to that individual. It's specific to that individual because it's constructed from that individual's significant uh, social experiences. And so behavior, folks, is not elicited um, by the perceived expectations of the generalized other, which is constantly changing with society. But instead, it's based on one's fan of community, which I take with me from one location to another, and it's specific to me. So I carry it to all my social situations and it fills in those critical gaps. So it shows the difference, right? It fills the gaps between why some people conform with our expected value system and others do not. And it also explains the permanency of myself because I'm seeing everything through my individual lens. So, um, uh, Dr. Athens came up, I'm not going to go through each of these, but he comes up with uh, 13 principles of what are known as his soliloquy principles. I'm not going to review these. Nakam will put these up and you can review them at your leisure. Uh, but he wrote a, um, uh, he wrote a, P, uh, pu he published a piece called The Self as a Soliloquy. And so he outlines the, the, um, the metamorphosis of our self that develops over our stream of consciousness. So 
we all could relate to this because uh, everyone hears voices in their head, right? We all talk to ourselves. And so, uh, and if you've ever been around uh, a toddler or a small child, you'll see that children actually soliloquy, soliloquy out loud, right? Before they learn to internalize their, their, their thoughts, they're actually speaking what they're thinking, right? So Mead, uh, he conjectured that the individuals converse with themselves and the generalized other, which as I mentioned earlier, represents the attitudes that we all have, society at large. Athens expanded on Mead's concept and he proposed these 13 principles, right? That govern how we soliloquy within the phantom community. And so it's in that regard, it's in that regard of how we come to understand the individual perspective, the conformist versus nonconformist. And so it comes down to perception. That's why individuals who are looking at the same situation, right, will interpret it, sometimes will interpret it very differently. So here I have a, a you know, sort of caricature here of a woman who looks at a bee and sees it as something very positive. The man there on your right looks at it and sees it as something quite negative. Same thing, but they're being interpreted in very different ways. Let me, so let me, let, me, let me show it to you in a different sort of thought experiment kind of way. And so what you see here on your screen is a, a black and white photo. And um, you see there is this, so if you ask someone, what do you see there? You know, they'll explain, well, it looks like, you know, you got a family there that's helping what appears to be the father, um, you know, retooling or, or fixing uh, some of the mechanics of this car here. And so the question that you would, you would ask in terms of this interpretive process is what, what scene or what do you think happens next? And so someone who's looking at this and has a sort of uh, negative kind of projection of the world, right, will look at this very differently in terms of what happens next as, a person, as opposed to a person who's interpreting this as something more positive. So the first time, I'll give you an example. The first time I saw this and I was in a training myself um, and the facilitator asked, you know, what do you, see, what do you imagine happens next after, after this scene? My response was, oh, it looks like, you know, they're gonna clean up there and, you know, probably go out and have some dinner. Well, the same questions asked of individuals who've experienced this trauma, who's ha who have this negative fan of community. And what they see is they'll say, well, I see that this little girl here, they become very suspicious of the little girl. And they've responded, well, this little girl is gonna smack this person, uh, is gonna smack the brother in the head or the car is gonna fall on the father um, and there's gonna be blood everywhere. And so, they're interpreting it in very the same exact, uh, same exact visual, but being interpreted in very different in a very different way, and so that's the impact of the fan community. That's the impact in terms of how you're interpreting various situations, and so the brain and the body adapt to one's environment, and so you can look at one scene: the neuroplasticity of the brain, the ability of the brain. Uh, to produce chemicals that result in a permanent change in the brain function. Stress is going to induce uh, negative changes in the brain, just like exercise induces positive changes, poor mental health induces negative changes, right? And adaptations can occur in the brain, just like any kind of physiological system that you train the brain um, uh, to become ultimately permanent. Uh, and so you're training the brain through those social experiences that individuals have, not just in terms of physiologically, how it impacts them phys physically, it also impacts them emotionally, mentally. It changes the way individuals will look at specific type of situ social situation. And that interpretive process that's happening will then lead to uh, different types of behavior. So here you have a, a cartoon here where, you know, you got the Bernstein bears there, right? So the world is a safe place. Right. And you look at, you know, the world as being trust, trustworthy. Right. It's a cooperative. There's focused attention. Um, 
uh, there's long life expectancy. An individual with a negative FANUC community who goes through the same kind of interpretive process will look at the same thing in a very different way. They will look at the world as a dangerous place. They'll look at it in terms of survival orientation. So instead of looking at it as growth and, prom and a promotion orientation, they'll look at the world as a dangerous place, a survival orientation. They'll be more distrustful. Um, they'll be hyper vigilant. Uh, they're more likely to take risk and they'll have. Um, they expect to live in a shorter life expectancy. And so this idea is universal. There's a universality to the FANA community. So here I have a, a couple columns that you can take a look at. So it's made up of three things here. You see an event, sort of like a trigger, what happened? That trigger then in terms of how you think of what happened, how do you think, what is your belief about that event? That then leads to consequences, emotions and behaviors. And so I've left certain things, certain, um, uh, certain parts of the table here blank. So you could sort of take a look and think about what you believe would happen given the consequences or what you think the consequences would be when you see the event as well as what that person believes. So, you know, I put some sort of generic kind of things here to short, sort of show you the universality of the Hispanic community. I failed the midterm exam, right? What's the belief of what, what do you think that person is believing if the consequences, the emotions and behaviors that result is that they get depressed and they stop attending the course versus another event, a friend doesn't meet me at the time we agreed on. She's usually very reliable and trustworthy. Well, what do you think the emotions and behaviors of that person is gonna be when you know what the event was and what the belief is? Versus, you know, the final line there where I have sort of the while standing in line at a local convenience store, someone cuts me in line. People are so disrespectful and should be taught a lesson in consideration. So what sort of emotion and behaviors are being triggered by that event when you have an understanding of what that person believes and what they think? Uh, as a result of that event. And so we could all sort of um, uh, make application here in terms of the universality of the fandom community. When you think about, think about the individuals in your own life, right? Who do you choose to confide in? Why did you choose those type of people that you confide in? Do you have other persons in your past or your present that could be relied upon? And in what ways do you think your life would be different if you didn't have the, the benefit, the privilege of having that person in it? And so when you think about those influential people in your life, you'll begin to kind of um, uncover who those individuals are in your life that comprise your own individual phantom community because you're doing it subconsciously. So every social interaction that you have, and it happens instantaneously, Every decision, every social interaction you have, you're actually confiding in those important people who've had an influence and a severe and significant impact in your life. And so if you have a positive phantom community in which you rely on and has had that positive impact and influence in your life, you're more likely to behave in socially appropriate ways than if you didn't. And so there's that universality of phantom community that we all could sort of come to understand uh, and believe in. And so there's an inter interconnection, therefore, on the individuals who have that sort of negative, sort of impactful, influential type of fan and community that impacts their day to day life. And then oftentimes they'll come and see us in the court having dealt with this type of trauma, having dealt with this type of uh, these terrible type of experiences that have impacted them in sort of tragic ways. And so there's an interconnection in terms of the traumatic experiences that individuals have and their fan of community. And so when we talk about trauma, we talk about it in accordance to this eighth study that I mentioned to you very briefly at the start of the, uh, uh, of the presentation, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And it came to understand what trauma is, I've defined it here for you, and um, and what the study kind of reveal, uh, revealed. And uh, Dr. Felitti came up with the study actually by accident. He came, up, he came upon it. He was doing a study uh, on obesity 
uh, incidentally, as he came up with sort of um, the impact that physical, emotional, um, sexual abuse uh, has in childhood and or adulthood, and the impact that individuals' family life, their family community has in drug addiction, alcoholism, parental incarceration, and generally violence. And so they did, it's a very long, extensive study. It was uh, over, uh, the, the, the ACES study was, um, uh, had oversight by the CDC as well as the Kaiser Permanente uh, collaborative uh, study. And it looked at the effects of the adverse childhood experiences, trauma, over the lifespan. And it was actually the largest study ever done on this, on this concept of trauma. And it took place over a 10 year study and it involved uh, more than 17,000 people. And in terms of the demographics and the specifics, it's, um, it was actually very well represented. So there was about 50% men, 50% women that comprised the, the, uh, the size of the sample of 17,000 people. Um, most of them were college educated for folks. Uh, three quarters of them attended college, um, over 60%, so more than three fifths of the, of the sample uh, were 50 or older. So they had lived a good portion of their life at that point. So they were middle-aged folks, uh, um, who were, who were being studied, who were, um, who had taken part in the study, uh, and across racial demographics, uh, 10% were represented by African-Americans and other 10% were Asian, uh, and 80% were Caucasian, but that also included, um, uh, the Hispanic population as well. And so this study basically uh, asked folks about their adverse childhood experiences. And the questionnaire, uh, as I mentioned, was developed by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente uh, and overseen by Dr. Felitti. And I'm not gonna go through the questionnaire, but it is a, basically it's a 10, uh, 10 questionnaire uh, that they asked people about their um, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, talked about their uh, physical, any kind of emotional neglect that they had. I uh, asked them about their family background, if they had a parent who was an alcoholic or addicted to any kind of drugs, or um, if any member of their family was diagnosed with mental illness. Um, it talked about if they witnessed any kind of parental um, abuse, uh, did they have any kind of abandonment from a parent, either through divorce or if they're, you know, the premature death of a parent they experienced any kind of bullying growing up and all those types of things. So it's a 10 question uh, questionnaire and there's a series of questions there. And so if they, if any of the subjects answered yes, uh, the researchers gave them a one for that ACE, right? So there are 10 ACEs and they gave them a one if they answered yes to any of them. And if they had uh, if they had a ACE score of anything uh, more than four, so if, you, if they answered four, uh, yes to any to more than four or more of these questions, that indicated that that child uh, would be at risk. And so they, um, uh, they gave them uh, lots of um, sort of feedback based on all those different areas that I mentioned. So interestingly, once this study was done, uh, and I mentioned there were over 17,000 participants in the study. They found, interestingly, that one in four people exposed at least two categories of those ACEs, meaning that 25% of the sample had at least had answered yes to at least 20% of the questionnaire. One in 16 were exposed to four. And they showed that more than a fifth of the children were sexually abused and more than, uh, more than three fifths of the women experienced abuse, violence or family, or family, um, uh, family trauma during their childhood. Uh, the study also showed that women were 50% more likely than men to have experienced five or more of those ACEs. And so what the study basically showed is that adverse childhood experiences impact a great majority of the public. It's very common. And so it also showed that, that um, it also showed the combination of the findings that um, ACEs, those adverse childhood experiences are often are one of the leading, if not 
um, leading determinant of the health and social well-being uh, of the country. And so what we what we experience being in the court, uh, unsurprisingly, is we're experiencing that segment of the population. We're experiencing and we're providing service to that segment of the population, that one is 16, that are exposed oftentimes to more than four of these categories. So when you put that together, think about the trauma that goes on in these question in the in the questionnaire that 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 we spoke about that we, I just mentioned in those in those questions and, and about the verbal and emotional kind of trauma and the abuse. When you think about that, think about and those social experiences that occur, think about what that does to that individual's phantom community. Think about the permanence that it has on their self. And think about more specifically how they view the world, right? Which Bernstein kind of scenario are they seeing? Are they seeing the world, someone who's going through such a thing, are they seeing the world as a safe place or are they seeing it more as a place of distrust and risk? When they're looking at that family, right? That visual of that family coming together to, to help that dad, how do they see that scenario? What do they think? Someone who's experienced four, five, six of those ACEs, how are they seeing? What do they think happens next as opposed to a person who's had maybe one, if any, right? Social experiences impacting that perception, that interpretive process of how we see the same social situation that triggers each of us and then results in that kind of emotion, behavioral kind of response consequence. And so what we talk about trauma, we're talking about it basically as a threefold kind of indication. First, reliving second, avoidance and numbing, and three, oversensibility and the irritability. And so when I say reliving, what I'm talking about is we're talking about the members of the public that are coming up to us in the court, right? With those kind of intrusive kind of flashbacks. Um, think like somebody coming back from a war, right? And so they're going to, because they're having sort of this reliving, these intrusive memory kind of uh, images and perceptions of what's happening, they're going to have more exaggerated emotional, physical kind of reactions to the same thing that may not trigger another individual. Remember, it's very specific. The phantom community is specific to the individual based upon those specific social experiences that they've had. And so reliving also includes this kind of um, disassociative type of experiences where they feel disconnected from one's individual body, as well as the environment. The second area, the avoidance, the numbing, they're going to more likely get involved in behavior and efforts to kind of avoid, to put themselves in a, in a position where they're gonna to try to avoid um, activities, feelings, or situations that they feel are associated with the trauma. So being in the court, we wanna make sure that we're not in a place where it's triggering something to them that they're gonna to wanna to try to avoid, right? Um, they're, they're, they're gonna have an inability, more likely going to have an inability to have positive or loving kind of feelings. Uh, their emotions are gonna be more limited. They're gonna have loss of interest and general avoidance, right? And finally, oversensibility and irritability. This, is, this relates to their kind of exaggerated startle response. They're going to be more on guard at time. Going back to that visual I gave you on the Bernstein, right? They're going to look at that same situation in a much different way. Um, they're going to have, they're more likely to have outbursts of anger, right? They're going to have shorter temper. They're going to interpret uh, individuals' behavior and reaction and communication with them in a very different, specific way. Um, and so... Some of the risk protective factors, I won't go through all of these uh, you know, for the benefit of time here, but some of the toxic factors, some of the protective factors, right? So we're talking about the um, child protective services, when we're talking about some of our domestic relation cases, some of our truancy cases that come up, right? In juvenile delinquency, some of the toxic factors that are going to increase, right, the risk to trauma versus those that are going to protect children and those individuals, opportunity, skills, recognition, clear standards, um, economic deprivation, availability of drugs, so on and so forth. So these are the, some of the things that uh, impact uh, uh, 
the ACE score of those individuals. So abuse, neglect, and trauma, making up those that ACE score has a behavioral impact, anger, disassociation, drug and alcohol abuse, that inevitably leads to socially non-conformist type of behavior that ultimately winds them leading them up into the courts, right? And the long-term consequences, social problems, apart from the social problems that we're gonna be dealing with uh, and the types of, you know, the worst chapters that individuals are going to experience in their life and come to the courts, you know, we're gonna be, de- they're gonna be dealing with their own kind of disease and disability as a result of the impact of those kind of experiences that they've had. So some of the key points here, right? So we have this where you see the adverse childhood experiences here that are, uh, that are composite of their social conditions and the locally sort of context in which they find themselves. And some of it may be historical, right? It may be something that's sort of a pattern uh, in, 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 in their specific family life that leads to all these types of things ultimately to an early death, right? Dying before you really, uh, that you, before you really should. And so 90%, right? Some of the, this is, some of the statistics are quite sobering, right? 90%, nine out of 10 women with alcoholism were sexually abused or suffered severe violence from their parents, right? The people that they're supposed to trust the most, right? Who make up really sort of the central part of the phantom community and sort of the uh, a key kind of level of individuals in which you're communicating with in that primary group. Uh, one in six men have experienced some level of emotional trauma. And when we're talking about the kinds of folks that we deal with on a routine basis in the courts, think about 92% of incarcerated girls report some level of sexual, physical, or severe emotional abuse. And on the boy's side, Any boy who experiences or witnesses violence are 1,000 times more likely to commit violence themselves. As a way of resolving dispute, that's how they've been socialized to see those types of things. And so this has an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, impact on the courts itself and what these, what this concept means and what the, um, the, um, uh, the results and the findings of trauma and the impact that it has uh, on all of us. Right? So let's finally, let's talk about how we take this concept and the, and of the phantom community, how it dovetails into those kind of traumatic experiences. How do we come to then apply it uh, in the day-to-day kind of things with the, with the course? Well, first and foremost is to understand that experiences matter. They not just matter, but they matter the most. And so people are not so much a product of their environment as they are about their experiences. So people are a product of their experiences and the interpretive process that occurs as a, by virtue of those experiences. And so some of the, uh, some, um, some of the research that, that will substantiate some of this shows that a sizable percentage, as I mentioned some of those specific uh, statistics before, percentage of adults and children that are incarcerated have some kind of traumatic kind of history, right? And the growing body of research shows that there's a relationship with an individual who's victimized, which the individual who's then doing the victimizing, right? So if you think of it almost like a movie reel, right? The individual who becomes sort of that, uh, who comes to us and we find them in the adult criminal court, who now is a, is a, you know, has committed an aggravated assault or a robbery or worst case has killed someone or what have you, right? If you saw that individual at the beginning of the process, right, when they were a child and they were going through those kind of experiences, you'd probably have more sympathy for them than antipathy, right? So it's a matter of seeing sort of the big picture in terms of how that person got to where they are. And so the individuals, many people with these kind of histories have overlapping problems. They have overlapping problems that impact them physiologically, right? Their addictions, their mental health, physical health. But they, on the flip side, they also are more, um, they're more inclined to becoming victimized and not just being victimized, they wind up doing some of the victimizing as a result. And so they wind up being this, they wind up being the perpetrators uh, in the end. And so this is, this deals with what we discussed earlier with the content of consciousness and it's very cyclical, right? So if you change the content of one's consciousness, you will change their experience. 
And if you change their experience, that will change their consciousness. So it's kind of like this snowballing effect, right? So it's not to say that the environment doesn't have anything to do with it, right? But you could put somebody in the best of environments. But if you put them in that same environment and expose them to all these kind of traumatic experiences, well, at the end of that program, right, you're not going to have a very socially well-adjusted individual. Flip side of it is if you have someone who grows up in not the best of environments, right, uh, myself included, right, impoverished growing up in an inner city, uh, but I had the benefit of having good, positive kind of role models around me, who ultimately were a part of my primary group, but more importantly, became a part of my phantom community, right? So I'm very sort of conscious of the people sort of that have that sort of that impact and uh, influence on me. So those experiences impact the content of my consciousness and they impact the content of your consciousness if you think deeply about it. And so it's about perception. And so to go back to uh, that caricature that I had earlier. So Dr. Lipton here shows that if you change the perception is the moment you rewrite the chemistry of your body, right? The brain is not disconnected from the rest of your body. It's that neuroplasticity, as I mentioned to you earlier. So the brain doesn't forget the body, uh, the, the body keeps score uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to quote uh, Dr. Ben Kalk, another uh, scholar in, in, with respect to this area of, of the field. So this, this idea of this neuroplasticity that you're able to change things by changing the perception. And so it's not, it's not the mindset, it's a mindset, right? And think of it sort of breaking it up as responsibility, having the ability to respond wisely or not and to make choices that move you closer or further to a desired income, uh, to a desired outcome or experiences. So a mindset is, the, is your collection of beliefs and attitudes that affect how you see that situation and then therefore ultimately impacts and influences your choices. And so when we're in the courts, well, we really have to start looking at our programs uh, and our sort of community development to the, to the extent that the courts are involved in those types of things. We kind of have to review things in terms of a victim mindset versus a creator mindset, right? Keeping, so a victim mindset is where you keep people from seeing and acting on the choices that ultimately could lead to their success versus a creator mindset, right? That causes people to see multiple options and the ability to choose wisely among those options and take effective actions to achieve that the life they want. So to go back to say, to create program, right? To create, um, to create a, a reality for those litigants, right? To the extent that we can, and the courts involved in those things is to look at it and to show and to recreate that interpretive process, right? To look at that situation, to see the options that exist. Um, and so much of this involves sort of their self-talk, right? To sort of go back and kind of reverse re-engineer some of the self-talk that they have. And the self-talk is comprised of three things. It's comprised of an inner critic, an inner defender, and an inner guide. And so I talk about it here very generally, and then I make application in terms of, let's say you're in drug court, right? So the inner critic, and we all have these things. We all have an inner critic, we all have an inner defender, and we all have an inner guide. And depending upon your phantom community, and the impact of that phantom community in your own consciousness will de determine what your inner critic is saying to you, what your inner defender is saying to you, and how socially well adjusted your inner guide is. And so the inner voice that judges you as being inadequate, you'll never make it. Your inner voice that judges others. And then the inner voice that seeks to help you make the best of any situation by giving you some of those impartial truths. He knows that judgment does not improve a, a, a difficult situation, uh, but it's able to sort of quell what's going on with in the inner critic and in the defender. So, for example, the drug court, you're in the inner critic of a potential defendant there will say, I'm always worthless addict, so there's no point in trying to get clean. The inner defender of that litigant is going to say, well, this judge has no clue what it's like to deal with the issues that I'm dealing with. Right? And the inner guide is to try to create that mindset in the drug court where those litigants will take ownership, they will make a plan and take action. And so 
Self-talk in terms of the inner critic, inner defender, inner guide is very important because what you say to yourself, what those litigants say to themselves, what those defendants, what those juveniles are saying to themselves is ultimately going to determine the choices they make at each fork in the road of their life. And it impacts everyone. It impacts the defendant. Like I mentioned, we all have that self-talk, right? We all talk to ourselves, right? We all have those voices. So if I was given, let's say a speech, right? Let's say I was scheduled to give a speech and you know, my, um, my, uh, my inner critic may say, you're gonna be horrible. You're probably gonna go blank and you're gonna break down and everyone's gonna laugh at you, right? My inner defender may say, well, you know, speeches are stupid. You know, I'll never have to give a speech again. What's the point in doing this? This is a terrible idea, right? I suppose my inner guide is gonna sort of quell that and is gonna say, you know, it's gonna silence that critic. It's gonna silence that defender, right? They're gonna be maybe in the background, but they're not gonna take over the stage in my mind, right? The inner guide is gonna say, I can do this, right? I've given speeches before. It's helped and assisted people. It's made very sort of positive contribution. Uh, everyone is nervous over such a thing. I'm very well prepared. I've done everything that I need to do. And I feel very confident going into this situation, right? And so that's where the inner guide kind of quells that inner critic, that inner defender. And so when we're dealing with a drug court program, when we're dealing with um, juvenile delinquency uh, issues and programs, right? We have to sort of engage and develop those programs with this in mind, because it's in that self-talk. Those folks are not going to be in front of the judge 24-7, right? They, ultimately, they're going to have that self-talk. So our programs have to be developed in a way to understand the impactfulness of that self-talk and to take that into uh, consideration. I would, I would submit to you that it should be central, right? The impact of that self-talk that is generated from the experiences they, they've had in those phantom communities are most impactful, right? So that's what I'm submitting to you. And that's what I think really needs to be um, uh, reviewed and considered uh, in, in, um, uh, in all that we do. So four effective ways that programs are structured to dispute those kind of irrational beliefs to kind of silence that inner critic and inner defender is to four ways, offer evidence, uh, offer a positive explanation, Three, question the importance of the problem. And then finally, offer a plan to improve the situation. So the program basis would be, you know, how does the defendant or juvenile quote unquote think about the event is a key issue, right? So in those conversations that a judge is gonna have, the conversation that the PO is gonna have, the conversation that the uh, juvenile referee is gonna have, right? They're gonna get into sort of, um, taking a look at how that defendant juvenile thinks about the event or those key issues, right? Irrational thoughts are actually the chatter uh, of that inner critic and inner defender. And so that strong inner guide is going to be both a cause and an effect of uh, the self-esteem that hopefully um, uh, will get that person off to a, uh, you know, making a change and getting them off to a better start, okay? So Athens takes this application uh, into, um, uh, uh, into talking about it more universally. And I took his keys of success and kind of applied it specifically uh, in the courts. And so I broke them down into sort of six areas that are more involved than, you know, it's very detailed and specific, but I've kind of given you the kind of summary here. Uh, so the first thing is, it's important for us to collect as a court is to collect the necessary biographical information that goes beyond what we're just seeing in the case record data. So how does that get done? Well, that gets done with in-depth uh, private interviews with the subjects that we're dealing with, right? We're taking that in conjunction with the case record because as we all know, the case record does not necessarily tell us the whole story. Um, the earlier, the better. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that, the earlier the better. And so the problems that I will submit to all of you that we see in the criminal justice system are actually not problems in the criminal justice system. The genesis of those issues that we see in the adult criminal court really need to be focused upon much earlier, 
they're done in the domestic relation courts and the family courts, and juvenile courts. And so ideally we should really have those, uh, that collection of information, those in-depth interviews, those, and with those subjects really would be most helpful uh, with those juveniles where you really have the ability to kind of change the script, right? To change the self-talk, to see what's going on in their phantom community and kind of flip it and try to change it while you can, because the later it occurs, the much more difficult it's gonna to be to change it. Of course, you're going to train those interviews, interviewers, excuse me, in terms of the concepts that I've been discussing with you today, right? Uh, Dr. Athens talks about a violinization checklist as a diagnostic tool. I'm not going to get into those very specific, but it's a violinization checklist that I've trained presiding judges and court executives on in terms of a very specific checklist that judges will go through for, I like to apply it, like I said, in the juvenile courts, that checklist to see what kind of violent kind of traumatic experiences that juvenile has had and how it's impacting in a very obvious ways. If you're asking and reviewing it in a diagnostic way, how it's really sort of impacting their behavior. Uh, and finally, um, it shows that diversion programs that provide intensive as well as comprehensive services are deemed to be the most successful. And research after research, all the literature typically will show that. And so the courts have to look at it more in a holistic, comprehensive way. And I'll talk about it uh, momentarily in terms of some of the key examples that I'll discuss with you in terms of how I see the comprehensive service that the courts can use uh, for these purposes. So more specific, let's talk about it in a really sort of pragmatic way. Uh, what's the connection with all of us who work in the court? So we have to come to this understanding that every contact we have with a litigant is an opportunity to either contribute to that first slide, that Bernstein slide, to try to contribute to a safe and trusting court environment or detract from a safe and trusting court environment, right? No one who's working for, and fill in the blank, whatever court you work for, is unimportant. Everyone is a part of the process. Everyone from the uh, reception all the way to the trial court administrator and assignment judge or presiding judge, right? Every and everyone in between. There is no unimportant person. If you work for the court, you have the ability, you have the, uh, the potential to make a significant impact on someone's life. And so every interaction that you have with those litigants and defendants, you're doing one of two things, whether you realize it or not. And so you all play a role in assisting litigants uh, to make progress in their lives. So what should we do? We have to ensure, we have to ensure that our policies, our procedures, the activities that we're doing, the environment, I'll talk about the environment in a second. Having worked for many years in operations, they're very sensitive to what the environment physically, what it looks like, right? And it has impact. Uh, the ways we relate and talk to each other will either create that safe and trusting environment or it's going to detract. And if they have that second sort of character of the Bernstein, right? They are looking at the world as a very safe, dis, uh, unsafe, distrustful environment. Well, you have to be very um, conscious of the kind of communication and what you're doing. You don't wanna be adding to that kind of interpretation where you're solidifying, solidifying that kind of interpretation of them, right? So in doing so, you wanna provide the effective services that, you, that we need to understand um, the life situations of our litigant, litigants and to make sure that you're not contributing, right, to that person's current problems. We may not solve the world's problems, right, but we want to make sure, all right, we want, we're going to do the best we can, but we, what we don't want to do is we want to make sure, like I said, we're not contributing to that person's current problems. Um, and so, as I mentioned, you know, many of the current problems that, um, that the individuals come to us in the court you know, they, they, uh, they should remind us that, you know, generally they're going to be related to some kind of traumatic life experiences. Those reminders, um, I refer to them before as, um, as triggers, uh, can cause a person to relive the trauma. And so we want to have them view our court organization, not as a source of distress, uh, not as a, um, uh, not as a source of distress. They want to see our environment as a healing and a welcoming environment, an environment where they can trust what we're doing. 
And so because we don't know the kind of experiences, right? We can't sort of, we're not inside everyone's uh, mind, right? We don't know the kind of phantom communities all our litigants have, right? Uh, so therefore what we ought to be doing is we need to approach litigants and defendants in a universally sensitive manner, not in a universal way that, you know, a panacea where one sort of broad stroke uh, kind of program solves everyone's problems. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we approach everyone with us understanding uh, and universal sensitive kind of way. And so understanding trauma and the impact that it has on the individual's fan of community in terms of their interpretive process uh, and those personal kind of traumatic uh, experiences that individuals have and the stress that's associated with that is something that we all need to bring to bear. Um, the other side of it, of course, is, uh, and this came up during one of my last consulting sessions when I talked to some of the frontline people, is an understanding that, you know, for some of us in the courts and hearing some of these tragedies and trauma uh, could trigger our own stresses in our own life, right? Because we all have our own phantom community. So there's stress associated, frankly, with working in the courts that can also impact our own emotional and physical well being. So we have to be also conscious of that. And because that's going to impact, that can, can um, detract right, from our own work success and satisfaction. So that's something else the administrator really needs to be aware of. So how can the court help? Here are some sort of pragmatic, practical ways that I've discussed, you know, uh, historically. What are some ways that the court can be destructive, right, can detract, right, and contribute to an already stressful situation versus what can the court do to be constructive, right? So I'm not going to go through all of these individually for the, for the benefit of time here, but one of the key points I do want to highlight is that you don't want to avoid this kind of silo thinking, right? Where, you know, I'm staying in my own lane, you know what I mean? Where, you know, someone comes to you and asks you a question, uh, and you say, well, you know, I don't know, and kind of walk away, right? There's no wrong door. How you be uh, constructive is to say, you know, there's no wrong door philosophy. How can I help you, right? How can I help you? Um, Here's more destructive kind of versus constructive ways of looking at things. Uh, materials, communication, the person's language versus language barriers, if it, inefficiencies in the bureaucratic nature of the court versus taking a look at some of the uh, business processes of the court and making sure they're as efficient um, and as helpful as possibly. So an examination and a re-examination, right? This should be cyclical. This is not like, well, we've done it, we've done it once, we're never gonna do it again. No, you're going to look at your rules, your policies, your procedures, make sure they're clearly explained. Are you doing things to ensure that they're, they remain flexible to what's going on uh, contemporarily in the, in, in the real world? What's happening? And is the, is the court responding to those real world circumstances in the best way that we should, right? So those are sort of constructive ways, changing the mindset, uh, being nimble and adaptive to those kind of things, right? Um, uh, and then finally here, um, you know, you're going to, you know, versus looking at, you know, the difficulties as symptoms of a mental health substance or medical problem or versus being constructive is recognizing that those issues are brought to bear and maybe symptoms of what the person is experiencing, right? So you're going to increase the, the court's awareness, their knowledge, right? Their uh, KSAs, their knowledge, the skills, the abilities of the entire workforce to deliver services with this in mind, right? To, in a way to deliver research informed treatment that's designed uh, to address the cognitive, emotional, um, behavioral, uh, and different types of problems that are associated with trauma, knowing that it does impact the interpretive process that makes them uh, or, con or significantly impacts and influences the kind of life choices that they made that ultimately brought them to the court for better or for worse. And, uh, and, and to, to do it in a way where you're gonna try to expand on it um, and um, uh, towards the, um, the family and juvenile court as I submitted to you. That's not to say that we're gonna give up on everybody who's ever in the adult criminal system. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we have the we have um, we have the best opportunity uh, to confront the issues that impact our younger 
uh, uh, our younger uh, litigants, uh, Earl urine system. And so the other thing that the court has to recognize is that, um, is that the people we serve uh, are, you know, we're not, we're not living in a, the court itself is not a silo, right? So we're a part of, and we're affected by a larger service system. That larger service system includes not just, you know, uh, uh, other courts, it includes housing, it includes corrections, it includes um, uh, healthcare, emergency care, social services, uh, schools, of course, and other kind of environments that are gonna be impacting, um, you know, like substance abuse programs and treatment services programs, right? So we're a part and parcel of that larger service system. So we have to recognize, um, we have to recognize that we're a part of that. So with that comes an opportunity for the courts as well to engage and increase our awareness by being a part of that, those service providers, bringing them and looking at it in a way that, um, uh, that is able to uh, deliver care and service in a way that's trauma informed, right? And so uh, when you don't do that, the, the efforts that the court make are more likely to be undermined uh, by other parts of the system. I mean, to the extent that they're not already undermined by other parts of the system, when we don't recognize that and we're not working in, in, in concert with those other parts of the system, it's going to, uh, it's going to undermine it more, frankly. Um, and so uh, bridging the chasm here uh, is talking about an improved recognition and the treatment of not just looking at the whole picture, right? Looking at substance abuse, domestic violence, child abuse, trauma generally, understanding the benefit that comes along with mass education uh, and child development, including the media, including the schools, and thinking about, as I mentioned, being adaptive and nimble to what is happening in the real world, delivering new directions for treatment and prevention, routine screening of trauma. Uh, I mentioned some of the uh, specifics regarding the, uh, the training and the, uh, uh, that's involved and the in-depth kind of interviewing that goes on beyond what we see just on the paper, just on the court record, really kind of delivering on um, what's going on. Uh, just a very quick, I'll give you a quick example. I was interviewing one, uh, uh, for the uh, Jude Del Prio mentioned the, the, the film that I had written and, and produced, you know, the, over the course of the research that I was doing for that film, I interviewed, I, I interviewed scores of uh, incarcerated individuals who were convicted of very, very uh, horrific things, uh, very violent kind of things. And one of the things that, as I was interviewing one of the, uh, uh, one of the folks, the clinical psychologist who was a part of the of, of the film, he, she was talking about um, talking about some of these kind of traumatic experiences some of the uh, defendants have had, uh, and there was one defendant who claimed that you know he had never suffered any kind of trauma at the hands of his mother or father or any kind of member who would be referred to as a primary group, a part of their phantom community. And as they started talking to that individual over the course of days and and, and weeks and, and months. Uh, they realized that at one point his father uh, had uh, taken his fingers and put them in a car door and smashed and broke his four fingers of this child. And when the psychologist looked at him and said, I thought you said that, you know, you, you were never abused. You were never harmed by anybody in your family. And the guy turned to, to, to her and said, oh, you know, that was an abuse. You know, I, you know, I was a bad kid. I deserved that. And so those are the kind of things that you're not gonna get from the uh, case record. Those are the kinds of things that are gonna materialize and be brought to bear after you have those kind of in-depth conversations with folks. Uh, the, one of the key things that Dr. Athens talks about is you know, char you know, delivering on these interviews in a way that you're charging individuals uh, and you're compensating, excuse me, compensating the individual by the hour rather than by subjects to allow them really to kind of uh, do a deep dive on what's happening within those uh, individuals' lives, particularly the juveniles, right? So that's all part of sort of bridging the chasm, involving the involvement that we know we don't know what we don't know, uh, and to understand that the issues that we're dealing with in the court actually may be, uh, or in my, I'm submitting to you that they are part of this down. We're at the downstream wreckage uh, of these adverse childhood experiences that are impacting these folks. Um, so finally, let me talk to you about some of the five 
uh, sort of uh, practical kind of things that I've done in the past and I've consulted on. Uh, the first is sort of talking about general education or program and part two, uh, partnerships. And this is where the court, as I talked to you about, you know, very briefly about thinking of the court as a part of the system, not as an isolated part of the system. And this is where essentially where the court is going to partner with schools and community groups to educate and then clarify the misconceptions that adolescents, pre-adolescents have regarding the use of violence and the consequences of their actions. And so the courts and the educational institutions will come together, they'll partner. And so, so we see some of this, like for instance, in Law Day, right, where we sponsor pro programs and instill the values and responsibilities um, and talk about, you know, making sure that they're advocating zero tolerance for bullying, for instance, and really highlighting the importance of mentoring and giving that kind of um, positive role model to children. Uh, number two, family justice centers. And so again, a sort of comprehensive review of this ongoing development and the support of family justice centers or institutes where um, at-risk families are targeted uh, for home visits, um, educational outreach, uh, and other kind of forms of support. So because the levels of risk vary, right? Um, there's an overriding purpose to strengthen the family unit by making it um, uh, by making it self-sustaining and ensuring that children within those at-risk families are receiving the appropriate kind of rearing to make sure that they don't grow up and they don't develop these sort of violent kind of interpretations that may be um, solidified in that phantom community, right? So it consolidates uh, the, the one court that I worked in, um, uh, in New Jersey, we had a family justice center. There's also another example would be the one in Maricopa County known as the Regional Court Center there, uh, under, under which the phantom community actually concept can be incorporated, right? This consolidates multiple settings in the Superior Court, in the District Court through um, a direct um, complaint process. And it co-locates judicial officers, court staff, attorneys, right, prosecutors, defense counsel, uh, interpreters, because you want to make sure there's no language barriers, POs, uh, and the various, you know, subject matter experts and, and technical folks that deal with treatment services, um, uh, individuals who work in the sheriff, of course. And so it develops a screening process and there's assessment process that brings all these players together. And it's done in a way that's culturally relevant. It's done in a, a way that's culturally sensitive. But most importantly, it's done in a way that's confident. And it brings into it brings in this collaboration that really makes a difference. Uh, number three is this intervention of belligerency onset. I go on into, into this concept at length. Uh, if you have any kind of familiarity with the violentization theory, this will be familiar to you. And this is this is taking seriously the idea of truancy, bullying, any kind of minor violent performance that the judge encounters. Uh, with the juvenile in those family courts, um, in those juvenile courts, uh, relate directly to the belligerency stage of violinization. And so therefore, when you're hitting on that, uh, it's important that the court intervene with the knowledge that the methods that we're employing in the courts at that critical period in response to that child's behavior can really mean the difference in them continuing down this, these, these subsequent stages to more serious violent performances, right? That ultimately lead them to a life where we're gonna wind up seeing those folks again, but this time we may see them in the adult criminal court, right? So it's not uncommon, it's not uncommon that you have belligerent students that ultimately get expelled from school and there's no alternative. But the problem with that is that only exacerbates their aggression. It only exacerbates the issue of them winding up spending um, more time in the same milieu that was responsible for their violent uh, behavior to begin with. And so the courts here, again, can work in tandem with schools, social agencies, uh, to think about other kind of academic alternatives. Um, at the first sort of sign that there's something going on, at the first sign that something is really sort of impacted. Okay. Uh, number four, nonviolent coaching and mentoring programs. Uh, Dr. Athens talked about this in his, his study as well. This is a highlight of sort of a critical aspect uh, of coaching 
mentoring, informing uh, nonviolent resolutions, right? Sort of impacting and making changes in that interpretive process to make sure that what they're seeing, right, is is a way that is being interpreted in a more positive way, right? The the uh, the inner critic and the inner defender is kind of being quelled, right? It's not being um, uh, it's being not silenced because it's always going to be there. Everybody has it, but it's not taking center stage, right? So nonviolent coaching, uh, mentoring, right? It's a real sort of viable method that the courts can intervene and can require as a part of, uh, you know, as, as a part of the court order, right? Uh, the literature is replete with the, uh, uh, the support and the benefits that mentoring programs have to reduce delinquency and diverting youth from what ultimately would be a crime, uh, um, exacerbating that crime continuum. So it's very important in that regard. Uh, and then finally, uh, the court serving as a legislative liaison, really as the subject matter expert. So we know, right, we're dealing with those defendants, litigants on a first, uh, uh, on a first name basis in, in, in some instances. And so the data shows that people are going to commit most violent crime, you know, during, between the ages of 15, 30, right? So um, we serve in that subject matter expertise area by providing the data and to show that um, to show that we are in fact the subject matter experts and what the courts need vis-a-vis -vis those family justice centers, those programs to intervene in belligerency, those nonviolent coaching and mentoring programs. What are the kind of things that we need as a court that we can institute as a part of our day-to-day -day practice to make sure that the court directive initiatives uh, recognize the impact of trauma, but more importantly, what can we do to uh, mitigate the experiences that ultimately lead to poor choices, right? And so if you have, I've given you a lot of information. I understand that over, I went over a little time here, but I've given you a lot of information. I'm sensitive to that. And so um, certainly if you have any questions or comments, here's the last slide here with my name, uh, my personal email address, as well as my mobile telephone. You know, drop me a line or give me a call if you have any questions or comments. I'm happy to um, correspond with anyone who has any other uh, questions, comments, or have any other kind of interest. But thank you for giving me the time and thank you for attending the session. Nikon would like to thank Joe Pizzari for an excellent thought-provoking uh, program this morning. And uh, we'd also like to thank you for viewing this program. Remember, if you have any questions or desire additional information, you may contact Joe directly. Erin, it's a wrap.